right? Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Futurist. And today, I noticed that there's like a lot of bubbly discussions going on, which is wonderful. I also heard already over there a rumor that we might actually be colliding some ideas today to, uh, together from different perspectives. And that came from you guys, not from us, so it's really happy to hear that some sort of co-creation is actually probably happening today. I'm gonna give you a really, really short intro what we're gonna do now during this morning. And uh, first of all, for those who have been first time here at our premises or meeting us, so the company that you're, is hosting you today is called Futuris. We're a innovation engineering agency and working with a bunch of clients helping out with their innovation agendas. So everything from what kind of things to explore, how to validate those ideas, how to actually get those into services and then also designing and building services for our clients. And the topic of today so this is something that has caused, at least for me, early gray hair already. So, and I bet there's probably somebody else who is sharing my frustration around this topic. And I hope we will have an interesting discussion after, after the two talks today. And basically for you who haven't been reading our intros before this event, so we're talking today about GDPR and AI. So how does GDPR impact the training of machine learning? What compliance does GDPR actually set for machine learning? And what is actually this whole these things impact on, for instance, financial, financial industry? And I know that we have in the audience a lot of people from financial industry, so I'm really curious of hearing during the QA about your, your struggles, your observations around this topic. And agenda today, so two speakers, Q&A. We're ab about ending today around 10 o'clock. After that, we can all head to our normally daily lives. And after the talks, you still have time to grab another cup of coffee or stay here to talk with us. Also, we are doing today live stream. So we have some, some viewers behind the screens and please, if you are listening to the live stream, share your questions. There's a link at the live stream, so we will be picking up those questions first when the QA starts. All right. Since you have came, come to Futurist, and uh, we've been quite proud of doing a lot of co-creation, so I decided that we're going to do a tiny group exercise here at first. <laughs> but no worries, you barely need to talk to anybody. You actually only need to raise your hand. So just sort of quick temperature on what do we feel, how do we feel about this topic? So if I can ask you, those who actually identify yourself as data science practitioners, just raise your hand. Nice about 25% of the crowd, I would say. Which one of you actually talk about GDPR on your daily life? Nice, another 25, maybe 30. Which one of you think that GDPR has, is a positive thing? You really like, you, you felt like this is amazing thing. Nice. <laughs> I would say we're talking about 90% of the people in the room. <laughs> and which of one of you stay awake at night or have stayed awake, have, have missed a good night of sleep because of this topic? <laughs> at least our lawyer. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. From this intro, now we know a little bit about you, so I will introduce our first speaker. So we'll get actually to the topic. So the first speaker is Robert Sipola. And Robert is a data scientist and a developer. Robert has amazing patience of explaining the mysteries of machine learning to me as a non-data scientist. And uh, currently, 
besides of practicing machine learning and helping our clients of finding business problems worth solving with machine learning, he also really loves to play with his new puppy named Mo. <laughs> Welcome. All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming. It's great to see such a big audience here. Uh, yeah, I'm Robert. I'm a data scientist at Futurist. My background is in physics. Um, I studied physics in uni, and then I worked as a developer and as a data scientist now. Most of my projects have actually involved B2B companies, so uh, GDPR hasn't burdened my work that much. I, I'd imagine like consumer-facing products or companies need to be even more mindful than just B2B companies. But in the grand scale of things, it's good to be well-rounded. Uh, we'll start out today with some definitions. There might be a little bit boring, but we, GDPR in itself is a regulation and a law, so it might, it's useful to kind of go through the explicit definitions again, even though most of us uh, kind of implicitly know this. So personal data is any information relating to the identified or identifiable natural person. Um, data subject, the natural person to whom the data relates to, so we are all data subjects. Uh, processing, any operation or set of operations which is performed on on personal data or on sets of personal data, whether or not by automated means. So again, relatively uh, explicit. Profiling, any form of automated processing of personal data consisting of the use of personal data to evaluate certain personal aspects relating to a natural person. And then finally, I just, just to be safe, I took the Wikipedia definition of machine learning for people who might not be uh, comfortable with it. Uh, much of the GDPR addresses how to collect and store data. However, for the machine learning community, one of the most important parts of the law is Article 22, which deals with uh, automated individual decision making. I'm going to show uh, Article 22 on the next slide, but before we go there, we might, um, it might make sense to think about what's automated uh, decision making in the context of uh, the like, consumer finance industry specifically. Um, there's like the big, biggest two applications are most likely like, automated loans, so like automa automatically calculating the credit risk course and then fraud detection. Um, automatically calculating a credit risk score technically when, when you do that with a machine learning model you then you can use that credit risk score to uh, make the decision, decision of kind of giving a loan or not. Um, most banks uh, do this already and there are multiple fintech startups that are also doing this. Uh, I think in Sweden at least anything comes to mind they, they've been advertising a lot and they, they um, refinance consumer loans and uh, then there's a great Santa Monica based startup called Tala that does, uh, gives micro loans in emerging markets by just uh, calculating or like getting data from a person's phone and uh, doing the credit risk score by that. Um, these are mainly done by applying machine learning to structured data uh, about the applicant and then uh, and the, I guess the most used methods are um, deep learning or grading boosting methods. Then fraud detection. Um, again, automated evaluation of whether customer behavior is suspicious or not. All big banks do this. Uh, big, the big internet companies also do this. So every, every time I log into Google from a new browser, Google will send me an email asking if this was actually me. And I've heard that uh, the big banks have be, are, are, are so confident in their assessments that if they see suspicious behavior, they'll just cancel your card and send you a new one. And then they'll just let you know that, okay, we've canceled your card. New one should be in, your, in, in the mail in a couple of days. Um, so here's 
Article 22 in its full glory. You don't have to read all of it. But the key thing here is that um, the data subject shall have the right to not be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. Uh, and then uh, Section 2 states a couple of edge cases uh, which, which are very important. We'll go through this in, in uh, detail in the following slides. So, does GDPR prohibit machine learning? No, it doesn't, thanks to those uh, uh, edge cases. But it does make machine learning or does create a significant, um, a significant compliance burden. Conservatively interpreted, you could look at Article 22 and say that uh, it's like a blanket prohibition on automated decision making when there's no human in the decision process at all and it produces significant impact on the data subject. Uh, and by automated decision making, the law refers to any machine learning model which makes predictions without a human being involved directly. So you could think of, uh, as an example, a computer vision based dermatology app uh, where you take pictures of, for example, your moles and then that would say that if it's um, uh, a malignant mole or not. And if there's no human in the loop in that kind of ev evaluating if, if that's a uh, um, correct predi prediction or not, then it's technically automated uh, decision making. And in the consumer finance uh, industry, it's mostly automated loans, then other recommendations, and uh, as mentioned, law, uh, fraud detection. And if you're wondering the pictures, uh, I used the word prohi prohibition there, and there, these are people in 1933 in the United States celebrating the end of uh, prohibition, so the 18th Amendment. And that's basically us data scientists celebrating that GDPR didn't take her job away from us. But yeah, let's talk about the exceptions a li little bit. Um, like I said, it turns uh, machine learning into a compliance burden. Uh, and there were three exceptions. The first one was when like, machine learning is legal when the decision processing is necessary for contractual reasons between a data person and a data controller, uh, when it's separately authorized by another law of an EU member state. This is um, in the Q&A section. I would like to kind of talk about how is this um, Sweden has this law of I forgot the name of the law, but like Hitapunk SE works uh, here and like that. There, it has to be somehow non-compliant with GDPR, right? It just doesn't make sense to me. So in the Q&A session, we could maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, and then when the data subject has explicitly given their consent. Uh, in pr so in practice, when a data subject has given their consents, consent, you should be okay to do machine learning. The real issue then becomes with managing the user consent um, as the users can consent to kind of many different things and they can withdraw their consent. So uh, consent management uh, needs to be granular uh, so that like, users can do, give their consent to many different things, uh, dynamic and then user friendly so that it's easy to understand how the data is used and how to assert control, control over it. As a kind of a good example of this, uh, last night I signed up to the Guardian's a news into two here, but it, as you can see, it's very granular. It's relatively easy to understand, um, and uh, they, they even ask about like different channels. So apart from email, they'll ask about SMS updates, and then they'll ask if, if your data can be used, for example, in uh, market research or general data analysis. I think um, when GDPR came to law in 2018, I think like, many of the big insurance companies did a good job with their um, uh, content policy, especially Google. Then we're going to talk a little bit about 
last key model, uh, which uh, it, like the the gist of the model was that it's just really freaking huge. It has 1.5 billion <coughs> parameters, so trying to get like explanations or on uh, understanding how the kind of um, the back propagation came up with all the like minutiae of the model, uh, parameters is next to impossible right now. But GDPR it itself also um, states like there's apart from Article 22, there's Article 13 and 15 which state that the data subjects have a right to a meaningful information about the logic involved and the significance and impact of the automated decision making that they're subjected to. And there's Recital 71, uh, which just states that data subjects are entitled to an explanation of the uh, automated decision after they're made, and they can challenge those deci decisions. If, is that enough? I mean, do we have to like, yeah. you know, um, show the user every point in the decision to sort of, you know? The, the unfair un answer there is that we don't know until people start getting sued. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's effectively, that is literally where we are right now. So, because it, it'll end up, uh, the final decisions will be made by the EU uh, courts, or so the member state courts. So, like, that's the final <coughs> say, and we don't really know until that happens. Yeah, so there are no like precedents. No, the, it's it's more about no, right? No. Yeah. Early stages. Of yeah. So unless un, until people get sued and those uh, uh, cases go to court, we are kind of in the blind here. But there, are, that doesn't mean that people haven't started to take uh, precautions for it for this. Um, uh, in the next slide, actually, there is like explainable machine learning is becoming more and more a thing. So technically, what we just discussed, uh, the provisions could be interpreted by the member state courts very strictly, meaning that they could require full explainability of a model's inner workings. Th this seems unlikely though. Like I, I, like I just said, GPT-2 has 1.5 million parameters. It's, right now it's next to impo impossible to explain how uh, the training uh, method or the, like the training process ended up with the, the certain like, numbers for those parameters. <coughs> Uh, a more reasonable alternative is that the EU regulators and courts will enforce an interpretation where the data subject has a right to some basic information about what's occurring. And, you know, the basic information could include statements like uh, what kind of model was used and what percentile did the data subject belong in the decision distribution, etc. Uh, but also there's a lot of research going on to this topic of explainable machine learning, so um, so-called locally interpretable model agnostic explanations, LIME, are becoming more commonplace and the depend uh, DARPA's explainable AI initiative is being developed further. Uh, and actually that's roughly my slides. Uh, we're going to send you all links to this um, kind of um, links on, on the follow-up email, but there's a couple of great kind of papers that you can dig deep if you're interested in. So Goodman et al. Uh, in 2016 was a paper by um, two Oxford statisticians who basically combed through uh, uh, the, the regulation from a machine learning practitioner's point of view. I re relied very heavily on their uh, interpretation. Then Ribeiro, Ribeiro et al. Um, 
is the original paper introducing Lime and uh, GitHub package, uh, or sorry, the Python package uh, on GitHub. And then there's DARPA's uh, XAI update from 2017. I've printed them all out here. So if you want to look at them during the Q&A, feel free. And then kind of I want to end up with a positive note for the finance industry because most of the, the discussion hasn't actually, uh, when it comes to GDPR, most of the discussion hasn't actually revolved around uh, banking. It's more about ad tech. And uh, last month, or no, sorry, March edition of Economist had an uh, article called Europe's GDPR offers privacy groups new ways to challenge ad tech. And the gist here is that right now the kind of the popular or popular opinion uh, and the media uh, focus has been very much on ad tech. So, and there's a British privacy group called uh, <coughs> Privacy International, which has actually uh, argued to uh, European courts that, or regulators that legitimate interest in the context of GDPR uh, is like, or banks have uh, legitimate interest in the context of GDPR when they're doing stuff like fraud detection. So in, for the finance industry, it seems like you're in the clear, at least right now. But then uh, there's a whole other discussion of like merging GDPR with um, BST2. I'm not sure what the name of that re regulation, but that whole thing also becomes a little bit uh, complicated. That's me. Thank you, Robert. I'll straight away introduce you to our second speaker, who is Teemu Oksanen. And Teemu works as a lawyer at Futuris, so his work is to help all people who work in this company to stay on the right side of the law, or at least help us help us to understand uh, our contracts, but also like about the services that we are creating, so what kind of impact it might have. And recently Temu's interest has been understanding more and more how how could we deploy new technology at the same time when privacy legislation and ethics are tightening and tightening. And of course, in the meanwhile, he's been pre preparing for the, uh, this presentation. He has been also been playing with his dog, that's, whose name is Lex. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, I took off my jacket because uh, I think uh, Robert all already had all those references uh, to different articles on the GDPR. I'm not going to have any direct uh, references uh, to the articles here, so I, I'm not acting as a lawyer here, but presenting my own opinions and, and kind of market, uh, market opinions here and, and more of a, a discussion, of course, from a legal point of view, but, but still. Uh, so, as you heard, personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable living person. And the point here is, of course, that uh, identified person, if you have a name, if you have a personal ID, if you have something like that, uh, the person is, is directly identified uh, from that data. But the, the interesting thing also from a machine learned perspective is that also uh, any information relating to an identifiable uh, person, living person actually, uh, is considered personal data. So if you have enough of data about a person, but you don't have his or her name, uh, personal ID or, or, or such kind of direct in identifier, it's still personal data. Because the more you have uh, data about a person, you're probably going to recognize who that person is. 
and, and that might be problematic uh, from a machine uh, learning point of view as we talk about, for example, big data. Then again, I think uh, actually as a lawyer, I don't think GDPR is about those uh, emails that you received last May. I don't think GDPR is about those huge fines that may be issued uh, according to it, but it's about you. Uh, it's a human right uh, to know how your data is used and, and you have rights to your own data. And that is uh, basically the European uh, point of view to data. That is your data and you are allowed to know, you are allowed to kind of uh, uh, give consents uh, to companies how they can use your data and so on. Whereas in, in America, the, the case still is that data is considered kind of uh, owned by the business instead of, of, of people themselves. So that's the distinction between the European and the US view. Okay, then to the machine learning. Uh, Robert uh, spoke quite a lot about how, how to uh, apply machine learning, but of course the first step, as, as he also referred, uh, is the training of, of, of uh, training part of, of the machine learning. And um, there are certain problems uh, when you compare the, the kind of training of, of machine and, and the basic principle of GDPR. Uh, one of the basic principles under GDPR is the purpose limitation, which basically means that the data can only be processed for, uh, for a specified and explicit purpose that has been mentioned to the, uh, to the person uh, affected, so the data, uh, data subject. And any future purposes that may uh, be or, or may come into life, uh, they cannot be uh, incompatible uh, to the original purposes. Otherwise, you have to ask uh, kind of a new consent for those other purposes. So uh, the problem is that we have a lot of data nowadays. Uh, it's been probably collected for certain reasons, but it, we haven't told them that, that it could also be used for a training purposes. So is training some kind of new uh, way uh, to process the data? Uh, probably is. So uh, then it comes to the conclusion that uh, have the people been kind of could they have had the idea that, that it can be used also for training purposes instead of just like personal, uh, personal, for example, mortgage um, uh, granting? Uh, then there is also the basic principle of data minim uh, minimization, uh, basically meaning that you should only process data and you should only collect data uh, that is actually needed for or necessary for the purpose uh, you use it for. Of course, as we know, machine learning needs a lot of data. The idea is the big data. Um, and, and we need a lot of data actually to be precise and, 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 and to the learning data or training data to be uh, representing as re uh, representing as possible. So that kind of also is in contradiction with the data minimization uh, principle. Then there is also the storage limitation. Uh, so the data should not be processed longer than is necessary for the, for the purpose that was mentioned. Uh, problem of course is that we don't know where we are going to use the data that we have. So it seems that it might be very problematic to use uh, data that we have for, for uh, or as training data according to GDPR. There is explicit uh, exception when it comes to statistical data. So you can use uh, data for statistical purposes. But the problem here is that GDPR says that the statistical purpose implies that this result, so the statistical results, cannot be used in support of measures or decisions regarding any particular natural person. So basically you can have uh, the machine trained with the data, but you cannot, uh, uh, perhaps according to GDPR, you cannot use it for making individual automated decisions. There is actually um, 
kind of related case in, in Finland from the National Non-Discrimination and Equi uh, Equality Tribunal. There was a consumer loan company who used uh, purely statistical methods for, uh, for assessing the credit worthiness of, of a person. So they basically made the loan decision based on uh, applicants' place of living, age, sex and language. Yes, in Finland it's considered that the Swedish-speaking uh, people are usually more wealthy. Uh, and the company actually said that they did not at all estimate any kind of personal financial status of the person or any other personal as aspects of the loan of, of the applicant. And that was uh, found illegal because you didn't or, or the, the company didn't uh, even try to have kind of a personal decision. Instead, it was purely statistical. The problem here is, of course, that, you know, machine is very good in learning correlation between the different kinds of data. But correlation is not the same thing as causality. So there is probably correlation between Swedish-speaking people who have probably more money to pay their loans uh, um, better uh, than the Finnish-speaking. Uh, but probably there is no causality in that. And that is the problem with the machine learning also. Then what about anonymization? Because when uh, data is anonymized, uh, when the data is uh, anonymous, the GDPR basically doesn't apply anymore because it's not personal data anymore. The problem is, of course, is it really anonymous? If you have a lot of data about a person, even though you don't know his or her name, if you know there's a lawyer who works at Futuris, uh, you probably know who he is because we have two and one of them is doing only HR and one is speaking at these events. <laughs> then uh, just to recap what Robert Ol Ol uh, already said, uh, there are specific rules for automated decision making. It can only be uh, used in, in certain cases. If it's authorized by law uh, for the agreement or, or based on explicit consent, and in all those cases, as Robert also mentioned, there is always the right to be informed about the, for example, the logistics uh, or, or the logic between, uh, be behind uh, machine learning. And that was a very good question uh, from the gentleman in the, in the first row. Um, what is considered like enough of information? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably saying that we use statistical data or machine learning is not enough. Uh, but I'm, not, I'm also sure that you don't have to tell kind of the, the whole logic behind it, not, not the kind of math behind it. Uh, that can even be your business secret, of course. But it must be something that the person actually understands. So if you, if you try to, uh, uh, try to um, tell the person even the kind of basics of machine learning, probably he will be like, okay, thanks and doesn't understand anything. So it must be something that the person actually understands. So no, I don't think you have to go through all the points uh, in the decision-making process, but, but kind of have the uh, overall picture about the process. So GDPR seems to be in contradiction uh, with machine learning. But I think it makes no sense to ask whether we want or not certain techno technology that is already there. We have machine learning. It is something that is happening all the time. And it, all, uh, it already has changed the world by being here, by its existence. As I already referred, GDPR has only been in force for a year. It is still very general and relative. The wording in, it, uh, in GDPR is, is very ambiguous. It's lacking the practice still, and especially it's missing the bright lines. So the legislature uh, has left a lot for the interpretation by the Court of Justice, as, as Robert said, and, and yes, there's also all the data protection authorities, and their kind of powers is, is very similar to, to uh, the, the Swedish origin ombudsman uh, kind of uh, uh, authority. 
So it's kind of more flexible uh, and, and more cooperative rulings than, than kind of very, very strict rulings by the, by the Court of Justice. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion around GDPR and that is good. Uh, for example, the discussion about if the IP address should be considered personal data. That was around for about three decades before they actually made a decision that in, in most of the cases IP addresses, even the dynamic IP addresses are considered personal data. But that took like three decades. So if we have been under GDPR uh, ruling for a year, probably we don't have the answers yet. Um, also, I think that the longer period of uncertainty that we have, uh, it also allows kind of experimentation. Now we can kind of find where the lines are. We don't know. We will make some mistakes. Somewhat, someone has to pay for it, unfortunately. But now we have still kind of, the world is ours now. We can try things and, and, and see how they work on the GDPR. So therefore, instead of asking if we want machine learning or not, I think it's better to ask how we use it how, and, and, and how technology can interact with the, the, the humanity. And I think GDPR and, and the principles under it are actually very great tools for that assessment. This is kind of a slide that I have used for, for the whole year or two now when I've been preaching about uh, GDPR. I think the kind of key issues under GDPR is the transparency. You tell the people what you're doing, you're transparent. You try to minimize the processing of personal data. You try to anonymize or pseudonymize uh, the data if it's possible without uh, kind of making things too hard for you. You ensure that the users, the people uh, can use their rights that they are granted under GDPR. You ensure, uh, ensure the security and confidentiality. And when you have think through all these stages, then you document it so you can actually demonstrate the compliance to, uh, to the controller, to the data protection authorities. So I think the one day that, that data protection authority comes to my office, for example, I can say probably we're not like 100% GDPR compliant. But if I have that on paper, what we have done, what we have thought through, it's still better to show that we actually thought these things. Okay, we make, made mistakes here and there, but we have tried our best. And I think the, the data protection authorities uh, will find that valuable. To summarize the things is uh, a quote from Peter Paul Verbeck who is a Dutch philosopher of, uh, of technology. I think he put it very well here, kind of the idea that I, I, I told you. Technologies are already there, so let us try to understand how we want to live with them. Instead of looking for risks out of distrustful motives, we should actively interrogate our use and relationship of technologies. Ethics as a, uh, a component, uh, accompanying uh, technology development rather than judging it from a distant and disconnected vantage point. That's about it. I think it's time for the Q&A session because we have about 15 minutes of time. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Teemu and Roberts, can you stand up and look active. Uh, <laughs> so if you have any questions, I will pass around the mic so that we can capture the questions also for the live streaming. Anyone? We had a great, great question in between. Should we continue from there? I have a question for them. If the local courts in, let's say, Portugal and um, Slovakia get a similar uh, case, but they uh, do like they end up in opposite conclusions. Where, d or w with regards to machine learning uh, and GDPR, where does that then get propagated to? Like, what's the highest authority who will do the? Uh, who does the buck stop with? 
Thanks, it was uh, a good question. So basically the, the, the local national courts are still kind of the ruling ones. So, so in, in, uh, if you're in Sweden, you go to Högsta Domstolen. And, and there's no way to go over that in a way. But I think uh, if, if you have a question that relates to interpretation of GDPR, the Högsta Domstolen will ask the European Court of Justice kind of the, the they, they, they have the possibility to ask clarification uh, when it comes to GDPR from the European Court of Justice. Yeah, so uh, for the people on the webcast, uh, can we end up in the situation where, where two national courts have kind of different opinions on, on the case? Yes, we can, unfortunately. But, but I think uh, over time, of course, there is a lot of cooperation between data protection authorities. And as I said, if there are kind of any, uh, any legal question that is related to the kind of essence of the GDPR, I think any national court will uh, refer the question to the European Court of Justice because they all also want to play it safe. Yeah. On, um, to what extent do you need to anonymize data in order to train an algorithm for pricing or credit? How do you know to what extent you need to? That's a good question. <laughs> do you need to do that on a household basis? It's, it's effectively, it's still an op open-ended question. And so there it's, it's hard to kind of give a good answer to that. Um, there are certain best practices, of course, that you, you can think of anonymous there are multiple uh, anonymization tools offered i think the big co consumer internet companies because they do a lot of work on on open source technologies and they they do open source a lot of their their tech um, using them as best practices using their software as best practices is maybe the safest bet right now uh, but other than that it's it's kind of hard to like just tug your legal counsel and ask if this is okay or not. That's like, <laughs> it's an unfair answer, but like. Well, there are multiple, um, off the top of my head, you, uh, at least like if you're using the cloud platforms, uh, they have, I think they have, in, baked in methods to do anonymization. Um, you can do, well, and th then there's an another issue of this. Um, can you kind of reverse engineer data from the model, uh, which might end up being uh, um, problematic as well because like, even if you've anonymized the data, uh, and there's a lot of like these generative models nowadays where you can kind of create subsets of, uh, uh, of like, or b effectively you can create data out of nowhere, uh, or not out of nowhere, but like sample distributions. So then like there might be edge cases where those end up with uh, uh, kind of very similar to actual data that has, wasn't necessarily anonymized, but I'll I'll send a, like a list of tools of uh, on the email. Uh, there was actually a very uh, interesting discussion a uh, few months back, I think, uh, when they discussed the possibility of kind of um, is it enough from the perspective of of anonymous data if you kind of mess up part of the training data. You don't know which part of the training data is messed up, kind of made made, made wrong. If there is, uh, if if the the messed up data is small enough, it doesn't affect the the kind of the big picture, but it still kind of makes it harder to to kind of backtrace the data because it it might be a mistake that it makes. That was very good question. I. Uh, uh, 
I don't know if that's kind of feasible. And I think it's also, it could be feasible in some cases and in some cases not. So you have to take it from a case by case perspective, I think. And of course, there's also the time perspective that what is anonymous data today might not be anonymous tomorrow when we have more data and more resources. So that's, I think that's actually very good question where we don't get the answer soon, if, if ever. <laughs> uh, actually, one example did just pop into my mind. Google has this uh, initiative in Toronto called Sidewalk Labs. Effectively, they, I think they've uh, purchased or rented out a part of the city. Um, I think it's called the Toronto Docks. And they have um, like um, gr a grant to develop that area. It, it wasn't developed like it's it, yeah effectively google has like access now to develop the whole area and for uh, they're doing urban planning there um, and they have tracked because of google maps for example they have uh they have a lot of information on like how f how uh, people move in cities and like how congestion flows and etc uh, so they created a tool where they can kind of use anonymize people's movements in cities. Uh, I think they're using like Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and uh, they can, in, in kind of the, in the area that they are building and developing, they can simulate people uh, moving. So that's, that's a, like a, kind of a simple example of like they build a custom tool for this. And they, I think they're using data from all around the world, like people using Google Maps. When it comes to handling kids' data or underaged uh, persons' data, is there any difference there in terms of how you should ask for consent, et cetera? Yeah. I'm not sure. I would imagine there is. Uh, yeah, there is kind of, um, of course, the parents still have kind of power over they, their children. And, and uh, I think the, the most interesting question here is that what, what happens to the data when, for example, the, the child uh, turns 18? So uh, is, for example, the consent given by their uh, parents, is it still valid? Uh, the GDPR actually says that, that it, could, it should actually be kind of free asked at that point, but I'm not sure if it's possible because there could be uh, and yeah, there there are also certain uh, age limits under GDPR. The the general uh, age limit uh, for asking uh, for asking the uh, underage children's parents' consent uh, is 16. Uh, but in most of the countries, Sweden, Finland, I think UK, at least uh, have made a decision that the the age limit is. 12, if I remember correctly. But for example, in Germany, it's 16. So there we have the European-wide harmonization. <laughs> it's not easy to, uh, to, to, to do job also, uh, or in, in, for example, Sweden and, and Germany, because the age limits is actually different. So, yep. And there's kind of a harrowing example of, uh, from earlier this year about that, and specifically related to YouTube, where um, um, kids nowadays they'll upload videos and then like their parents will also upload videos uh, and apparently uh, I think this was this happened in February uh, apparently uh, pedophiles on YouTube would just go to the comment section and put like the timestamp there and they would kind of communicate with each other where like saying like th that's a timestamp that I like and YouTube didn't uh, like initially take the threat really seriously, then advertisers started to pull their ads, and they they like then they started to think like okay how do we tackle this? And I think it was the first time in their history that they for in February for for a short while they actually blocked all comments on videos uh, showing children under. A certain age, I, I forgot the age, but like there are there are very specific like use cases, or, and and there's yeah they they are kind of edge cases, and they are trying to take this more seriously. 
And I have to add one point to the the kind of child or children and the, and the GDPR. Related to the discussion, for example, in Germany, as I said, the, the age limit is 16. They think that, uh, you know, uh, parents should have power on their children or, or, or the decision making of children when using services. Okay, fair point. But I also think that, that, that children have their rights to, uh, you know, blocking them from using messaging services as a whole is also problematic, I think children must have possibilities to, to, to message with their peers, for example, and, and with, with their parents, of course, with the parents, uh, there's kind of the consent is there, but also with their, with their fellows. So, so I, don't think, I don't think making age limit of 16 is an easy answer. That is definitely not. I have a question. Uh, when it comes to the clients, where they are at, uh, when it comes to GDPR and, and machine learning, uh, are they trying to beat the system, or are they? Well, obviously, everyone is trying to comply with GDPR. But in your uh, experience, are they? Where where are we? Where is the frontier right now? I'd say clients. I mean, of course, depending on the industry, but uh, my experience has been that clients are kind of conservative right now with it. So I've been in sales meetings where uh, certain certain uh, methods have been ruled out just because they want to be compliant. So that's that's my experience so far. Yeah, exactly. I think I also think that most. Uh, Still, most of the clientele is is kind of conservative. They're they're afraid, probably not about the fines, for example, but also the kind of media media effect. If they find kind of breaching the GDPR, they they think it's too too huge risk. Um, on the other hand, there's also I think positive examples of of very kind of. Um, kind of conservative fields of business, for example, related to health. There are also a lot of kind of experimental things going on. Of course, you have to pay a lot of attention then, but, but I think there are also uh, clients who have been very interested in, 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 in applying machine learning, for example, in healthcare. And I think that's also good for the society because I think uh, that is the way we are going to go. Someone has to do it. And then, to a certain subset of consultants, I think GDPR has been good for business. Because, uh, like, lawyers. yes, lawyers. <laughs> for sure. But, um, and there was, uh, this is not necessarily related to finance, but um, after sev seven or eight months of GDPR, uh, I saw a graph of like how GDPR had effect affected uh, ad tech companies. Uh, and most big ad tech companies, meaning Google, Facebook, and Amazon nowadays as well, uh, were actually, like, they've been fine with it. It's mainly, like, the financial impact has been for the smaller ad tech companies uh, who don't necessarily, or who can't hire, like, the, an army of lawyers to make sure that they're, <coughs> they're like, 100% fine. Um, so it's like regulation always favors the incumbent. incumbent. I was there's uh, at least there's um there's a great website I'll send a link to called I think it's like gdprcompliant.eu or something but they they have they got funding from uh the European uh EU basically uh to create like a checklist uh and best practices uh, checklist for for uh, whatever like GDPR and when it comes to data uh, and if you're uh, their their target group is 
uh, small to medium companies. So that's at least like one source where you can go and look at like, uh, ha have I kind of checked, ticked all the boxes at least. Yeah, and I, I have to say that uh, probably you shouldn't seek for a kind of 100% sure, 100% uh, compliant because at the end of the day, we are running business and business is about taking risks also. If you don't take the risk, you, you won't get the reward also. So I think that you have to, you have to think things through and then you, have, then you just have to kind of trust your instincts also. So you can get like absolutely no, but you can get absolutely yes. You can get like 90% yes but there is usually risk. If you don't take the risk, I, I don't think you're gonna, uh, you're gonna be the, at least you're not gonna be the forerunner. You can wait until there are forerunners and, and then you can try to chase them afterwards. But I think that the ones that will survive are those who are willing to take the risk. All right. Thank you for the questions. We are heading towards end of our breakfast. Uh, I would like to thank you everybody who has been watching us through the live stream, everybody who actually came here today to have this discussion. We will be staying here for a while for you. So if you have more questions, please stay with us here, grab another cup of coffee, There's probably some sandwiches left still, and uh, let's have a great discussion all right from here. Thank you. down from Patty Mac Just never thought that it'd be like this The feeling of your loveless kiss And my heart hearted and But no matter what you say, I still sigh anyway. And all those things that made you laugh now only make you cry. Maybe, maybe it's not the same anymore. I guess it's not the same as before.
I feel so ashamed by those tears drawn to your eyes. They say much more than any of my replies. So much more than any sentence of mine could ever some the same. 